No. All right, that's all on you. Thanks, Veronica. Go ahead and call to order the City of Boulder Transportation Advisory Board meeting for November 13th, 2023. Before we conduct any business, I'll turn it over to Veronica, our technical host this evening, to go over our ground rules. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. All right. Uh, we are pleased to have you all join us today to strike a balance between meaningful, transparent engagement and online security. The following rules will be applied. This meeting has been called to conduct the business of the city of Boulder. Activities that disrupt, delay, or otherwise interfere with the meeting are prohibited. The time for speaking is limited to three minutes. No person shall speak except when recognized by the person presiding, and no person shall speak for longer than the time allotted. Each person shall be registered to speak at the meeting using the person's real name. Any person believed to be using a name other than the one they are commonly known by will not be permitted to speak. Please use the raise hand function to be recognized for public comment. If you're on the phone, you will need to press star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute. No video will be permitted except for city officials, employees, and invited speakers and presenters. All others will participate by voice only. The person presiding at the meeting shall enforce these rules by muting anyone who violates any rules. The question and answer function is enabled. It will be used for individuals to communicate with the host. It should be used for technical and online platform related questions only. If an attendee attempts to use the chat for any other reason other than the ones seeking for technical assistance, the city reserves the right to disable the individual's access to the chat. Only the host and the individuals designated by the host will be permitted to share their screen. Thanks. Thanks, Veronica. That brings us to agenda item three, which is the approval of the October 2023 minutes. I believe those were sent our way today. Did anyone not get a chance to review them? Tila did not get a chance to review them. What time were they sent? They were sent at around three o'clock. They were posted oh. around one o'clock. With my apologies. Yes, I haven't. Like to... I didn't notice them come in. I did notice that they were not missing, and I assumed we were just going to punch it to next month. Okay. Um, um, if you would like to move it lower down on the agenda, I can have a look while we're on the meeting. Or we can punch it down the road to next month. Did uh, Ryan? Did you have any comments with? No, it looks good. Or... Looks good to me. I checked it out. Looks good. Okay. Well. Hopefully, whoever's around in a month will have had a time to review them all, and we can approve them. I mean, them. if I'm the only holdout, I can abstain. I, I had to go through them really quickly. I'll give them a closer look if I've got a full month to do so. Okay, thank you. Okay. That brings us to agenda item four, which is public comment. Any members of the public wishing to address the board about a transportation matter will have up to three minutes to do so. If you're interested in addressing the board, please use the raise hand feature within the Zoom platform and our technical host will call on you. Okay, um, let's see, Harry Ross, if you are able to confirm you're able to talk, I can start the timer once that is confirmed. Hi, this is Harry, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Go Hi. ahead. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'll keep to my three minutes. I really appreciate this time. I just wanted to uh, attend today as a representative of the Boulder Airport. And I've spoken to many of you. I've met with many of you about the airport, but I would just like to offer up a little bit of information about it and make myself available to anybody else on the advisory board that would be interested. Some background on the airport. This is from CDOT's economic impact statement that came out just a couple of years ago. They do this for every airport in the state. Their most recent one says that Boulder Airport is contributing about 300 jobs to the local economy and brings in about $60 million a year. So it's an important economic driver for us. And most people think about the airport as a, a center for recreation, for recreational pilots, but it's an awful lot more. And that's what I'm really trying to educate people on. In addition to recreational flying, 
At any given time, there are probably 30 student pilots that aspire to go fly, most of them for the airlines. And this is where most airlines pilots get their first couple of thousand hours of training is in little regional airports like this. The airport's also a big center for emergency response. So we all remember what happened in the floods and that was the second largest National Guard air response in US history after Katrina. But the fire department, the sheriff's department, the National Guard, they all train there. I work out of a, a hangar that the light flight helicopter flies in and out of every single day. So when, when a car rolls over on the diagonal, that's where that life-saving helicopter comes from. In addition, there is really critical climate research that comes out of neon aviation and scientific aviation. These are the two worldwide research organizations that most of the national labs locally and, and nationally use to gather climate data around the literally around the world. It's also a great center for community activity. I sit on the boards of a number of uh, of, of airport community uh, locations, and we have weekly meetings that the entire community is open to. The community working group opened us up to a whole nother group, and that's been great because we've been able to bring them in to activities that we really took to heart and we've worked on very hard to try to be good neighbors is noise reduction. And so there are voluntary noise reduction guidelines that the airport users have put in place. And what I can proudly say is less than uh, less than half of the now non-compliant complaints come from pilots based at our airport. Most of the complaints really come from uh, pilots from other places like uh, Broomfield, Erie, and we're working hard to try to educate them about how to be good neighbors with us. The one that I'm working on most closely is lead reduction. Leaded fuel is still used at the airport. Thanks, Lord, Harry. Oh, that and concludes your three minutes. minutes, but okay. thank you for joining us this evening. All right. Thanks for having me. Of course. Uh, the next person I have on the list is Christopher Osborne. Um, if you can confirm you're able to speak. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Well, cool. you may begin. I very much doubt I'm going to take the three minutes. Uh, I would I would like to request that we look into uh, constructing a traffic circle mm -hmm. at the interchange between Table Mesa and South Boulder Road. Uh, it would help if there were no left turns, particularly the rather fraught left turn that comes off of Table Mesa to go onto the ramp to go west on 36, and the rather <laughs> terrifying merge across a bike lane when you come off of foothills and then try to travel west on Table Mesa. The uh, addition of a traffic circle there would eliminate all the left turns. It would also free up the traffic in that area. Uh, I understand that there are some pretty intense construction problems with, with choking that particular point, but I think it's worth our time to look into it. Uh, I grew up in Boston and New York, uh, and I can personally attest to the suburbs around Boston. So that's Acton, Acton Boxborough, Harvard, Concord, Walden, etc. Use this exact method to solve their interface between highway and local roads. And so there are plenty of examples of how we could deploy this. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Christopher. Um, Stephen, if you are able to confirm you're able to speak. This is Stephen? Yes, perfect. You hear me? Yep, okay. Um, I am just calling in. I wrote an email last week about the crosswalk being installed at 22nd Arapaho. Um, this is something that neighborhood and CU and Europa has been working on for years, if not decades. Um, and it sort of surprises being installed. I couldn't find any documentation on it on the city website. And we really haven't heard anything about it for the last few years. So um, so right now it's a crosswalk and I call it cross bike um, because there's a multi-use path there. So they have green paint and white paint. There's only one set of um, signs sort of at the crosswalk. So the cross bike actually, if you're heading west, is before the sign is even there. Um, and as you know, Arapaho's very high volume traffic and 
pretty high volumes, pretty high speeds if it's not clogged. Um, so I'm just wondering if there's any way to get with the engineer and to uh, see if they're going to install rectangular rapid flashing beacons that was planned years ago. Um, or if what is installed right now, which is very inadequate. I've tried it both walking my dog and biking. And you have to really know the, the motorists are not expecting a crosswalk there and they're not stopping unless you really flag them down. And as a six foot tall guy, it takes a lot of flagging. Um, so I was just wondering um, who to get in touch with within the city um, to have my email um, and do a walkthrough with uh, an engineer and see if it's it's done. Maybe there is plans next year to install lights, but I don't see any um, power or anything, any poles being put in. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Are there any other members of the public pushing to address the board at this time? If so, please raise your hand. Uh, we have Lynn. Lynn, if you're able to confirm, you're able to speak. Yeah, um, I wanted to gripe, actually, about all of the 15-minute neighborhoods that everyone's always proposing because you know, I have to commute out constantly, and I'm centrally located. There's not enough stuff at the Whole Foods by my place, and I have to go east, and I'd rather not go east at all, but I have to. And the other night I went, the Friends of Young was meeting at the uh, Out Boulder place, which is 47th and uh, that area um, east of Foothills, and at night, going across foothills, a 70-year-old woman in my bike, you know, with cars going 80 miles an hour, two feet from me. It's like, just really? Not pedestrian-oriented type environment. So as much as Boulder wants to be pedestrian-oriented, we're not. We're just getting more and more sprawl. And between the different places of sprawl, like the perfect example, is Waterview. You all know Waterview, right? The little 15-minute neighborhood anchored on a brew pub. That's real brilliant. Um, and on 58th and Arapaho. And a car garage for every unit. And guess where they're going to want to be going? West. They want to come west. And when they come west, they crowd the roadways and I'm trying to get out of town for one thing or another to get to Walmart or some store I can afford. And I have to compete with trash trucks, construction rigs, you know, major, major stuff. And I'd like to know what y'all are doing to make this environment safer and more friendly to a 70 year old who drives her car once every six months. Um, I mean, tell me about it because I wanna know. Um, and when are you gonna fix up um, Pearl Street where the fire was? Because I have to cross the street every time for three, four years now. Like the developers are salivating as they're building these new expensive places that don't, fund you appropriately for the impact that they cause as the wealth disparity increases. So you really need to be advocating to the planning board because you're just the fall board for what the bad stuff that happens in Boulder and you have to accommodate it. And it's not fair to the, to the tab to have to accommodate to poor planning. So go for it, please help, done. Thanks, Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. I'm not uh -huh. seeing any more hands at this time. Are there any board members or Natalie, anyone want to respond to any of the things that we heard tonight during public comment at this time? Sure. Yeah, we can. Um, Devin is here with us. 
this evening. And so he can speak a little bit to the project that we're working on at um, on Arapaho on the 22nd. Hi, good evening. My name is Devin Jaws and I'm the city's principal traffic engineer. And thank you for your comments, uh, Stephen, relative to 22nd and Arapaho. Um, that was a crossing location that had been on our list for quite some time. Um, really, I would say, sounds like for many years you've been tracking it, Stephen, but we were actively tracking it as staff um, really since 22nd got uh, designated as a neighborhood green street, recognizing that the connection of 22nd Street aligning with the shared street um, that can get folks to the Boulder Creek path um, is a very desirable crossing location for people. And we recognized also that the pedestrian signal um, that is located about 200 feet to the west of 22nd Street, um, we operate that signal in a coordinated way. So pedestrians uh, do often experience a short wait uh, when using that pedestrian signal, because it is trying to keep traffic um, along Arapaho coordinated and moving uh, in that manner. Um, but we noted that 22nd was a desirable crossing location and staff had worked last year with a consultant uh, to prepare a design. And then we had the resources this year um, because it was our top uh, crossing location um, to go ahead and get that installed this year. Um, relative to the RRFB question, that was something that we looked at very carefully. And one of the key considerations was the proximity to the pedestrian signal. And both staff and our consultant um, were concerned about putting an RRFB that close to a traffic signal. Uh, the concern being that with two kind of active traffic, traffic control devices that close to one another, uh, it might be possible that a motorist might be looking ahead to the signal and miss the RRFB uh, or vice versa. So for that reason, um, as well as the reason that um, our PICTIG does currently say that static signs are the appropriate sign for that location as well. Um, so for those two reasons, we didn't um, at this time feel an RRFB was needed. Um, but that is something that we can continue to monitor over time. We do intend to do um, some monitoring of the crossing volumes in that area, recognizing that um, it's been a while since a, a comprehensive crossing study has been done in that area. And if we find that people really are drawn more so to the 22nd Street crossing and aren't using the pedestrian signal as much, um, that might be a means for considering removal of that pedestrian signal and upgraded um, to the crossing of 22nd. Thanks, Devin. Yeah, thank you. Did the, you mentioned the PICTIG, that's the pedestrian crossing treatment and installation guidelines? Yes, thank you. I, I meant to say out that acronym and I, I didn't, so thank you. Oh, no worries. I was curious if you mentioned the it doesn't sound like warrant based on the number of crossers. Does that also provide guidance on how close it can be to another device, like stop control device? Some of that um, is left to engineering judgment. And in this case, okay. we felt the signal was was too close to be to have an RRFB that close to the signal. OK. Thank you. Any other comments on this item or any of the others that came up during public comment at this time. Not seeing any. That'll bring us to agenda item five, which is an information only item uh, on the annual update on performance based pricing and ramp. Is there anything pertaining to this information item that anyone would like to discuss while we're on the call? Tila? Thank you. Um, I had a little bit of email back and forth today, uh, curious about a couple of things I saw in um, the memo um, with Samantha Bromberg. Um, 
which were helpful. I, I feel like I should just update you <laughs> read the email. Um, so I am continuing it to be curious about underperforming blocks and some of the information in the memo on the NPP side. Um, sort of, uh, sort of, it wasn't very clear where uh, some of the boundaries were or some of the underperforming blocks were. I did appreciate them noting um, that three zones are currently, it seems like completely underperforming, average parking occupancy around 25% or below. Um, I will note that what is uh, recited in the memo based on the city manager rule uh, if any established NPP zone in the program does not meet the approved key metrics for three consecutive years, it may be identified by staff for termination. Um, this is a little frustrating to me because it seems to me it ought to be identified by staff for termination. Um, and I think that that should be true for any block that's found underperforming. It looks like Staff is really stepping up some of their data gathering and analysis on, on um, parking rates on some of these blocks. Um, but the statement in the memo sort of suggests that uh, a zone entirely can get shut down or not. As I recall, uh, and I hope Sam is on the call here, um, as I recall, the city manager can, upon his or her own recognizance, um, shorten that three-year period, can contract a zone, uh, might not eliminate a zone. So I just wanted to um, to raise these possibilities because I believe that there are, certainly based on some of the data, some of these NPP zones that are not performing or not really demonstrating that they're, they're serving um, the purpose that we were hoping. But I was also hoping for a little bit more granular data uh, about block by block, even in some zones, which I think probably can justify um, an ongoing parking regulation, but maybe not throughout the entire zone. Um, Samantha was very helpful and said that they are um, working towards eventually hosting a public website with the data. So I don't have any more updated maps, but hopefully and I don't really have a timeline on when we would get more information, um, but uh, there is movement toward making some of the data behind this much more transparent, which is great. I also asked about uh, program financials. So those of you who've been on the board for a little while might remember that in previous NPP updates, we had gotten um, sort of broad brush idea about how much the program as a whole was generating in revenue versus how much it was costing the city in enforcement. Um, and unfortunately, Samantha informed me that uh, our previous financial model, I'm reading from her email, was created prior to the COVID pandemic. So until we've had a chance to recreate the model accordingly, we're not ready to report out. Um, that's a little frustrating, but I am cognizant that COVID messed a whole bunch of things up. I just want to circle back to, and I wasn't here at the July meeting, but when the NPP program came up in, in context with the East Aurora expansion uh, and the staff memo basically said, we're not sure what to do. It doesn't seem to be a good tool. Um, the gist was from TAB, yeah, it doesn't seem like a good tool. We should probably think about um, making parking regulations sort of more in alignment with our current TMP as opposed to the MPP program, which was crafted in 1990, mid 1990s, when I say 96. Um, so I, again, would like to extend my um, willingness to work on a different, more flexible, better strategy. Um, I was also kind of waiting to hear about this input before I raised as my, as an individual person um, suggestions to the city manager's office about other underperforming blocks. Um, and I would at this time like to raise again, reiterate um, past tab advice um, 
to suspend any further NPP applications until we really have a better handle on this, because I think having the availability to the public to petition to include their blocks on an NPP program is simply raising false hopes at the moment. I think we were able to say very straightforwardly when we decided as a city and the city council under city council direction to stop doing the NSMP program, it was a much cleaner break. We could tell people, sorry, that's not a program happening right now. And I think we should be doing the same thing with the NPP. Thank you, Tila. I have some thoughts. Does Steph want to respond to any of that first though? Well, yeah, thank you, Tila. I just want to say there's no community vitality staff here with us this evening, but we did let them know that, um, you know, likely there would be just comments and feedback. So we'll follow up with staff to just let them know to um, tune in to the recording so that if there's any other information that they can provide, then they'll certainly follow up. Thanks. And maybe Teal, if you hear anything back, you could bring it up as a matter from the board at next at the next meeting. And I echo your thought on suspending the program similar to NSMP. And I think that's probably the sort of feedback that could best be plugged in at a, a council retreat. And um, I know we're going to talk about parking more broadly, parking code reform more broadly later under matters from the board. Uh, but if that's something that a majority of the board was interested in, maybe we could flag it as something to bake into whatever advice on the upcoming two years uh, for the next council. Maybe we can incorporate that into a way of um, most importantly, not giving anyone false hope uh, and certainly trying to minimize the amount of effort that goes into something if we don't think it's going to bring change. Any other tab feedback on this information item? Not seeing any. That brings us to agenda item six, which is a staff update on annual snow and ice program and the staff recommendations on the snow and ice response review project. Welcome yes, Scott. and Scott is here with us this, this evening to present. Um, and this is kind of a dual presentation. There will be some information about the project, the Snow and Ice um, Program Review Project, and then also our annual Snow and Ice Control Update. So um, it's kind of a two-parter. Take it away, Scott. Thanks. Yep. Good, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Scott Schleck, Transportation Maintenance Manager for the city. Um, and I'm going to share some highlights um, around our snow and ice response for uh, last year's snow season, um, our approach for this season, and then I will pass it on to my colleagues to um, present on the snow and ice response review. Um, so last season, uh, we received around average snowfall for the, um, for the season. Um, and had a similar number of events, um, as you can see in this slide, um, just slightly, you know, one fewer event um, and, and a little less snow than the previous year. Um, and we also spent roughly the same amount of money uh, from year to year. Um, I attribute, I think we're a little, little around $100,000 uh, difference from last year to this year. And I, I attribute that to some of the colder temperatures that we had during the middle of winter last year um, that, that extended some of our response and our ice control. Um, I also um, wanted to highlight, uh, Daniel, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, one, of the, one of the changes for um, this season is on our off-street and protected bike lane operators. We did add a dedicated vehicle and operator to the protected bike lanes for this season. Um, and that's something that we haven't necessarily needed in the past. Um, and, and with the uh, inclusion of the North Broadway bike lane and the baseline protected bike facility, um, it was warranted for this year. Um, in store for uh, Daniel, next slide, please. 
Um, in store for this season, um, we're going to continue our comprehensive training program that we um, started last season. Uh, we did notice that there were fewer major um, vehicle damage sustained throughout the season with that. Um, and oftentimes we're, we're pairing new drivers that maybe haven't ever driven a large truck in snow. Um, and, and we pair them with um, operators that have plowing experience to show them the areas and how to operate those plows during those stressful situations. Um, and then um, it, it also seemed to um, decrease the amount of um, uh, improperly plowed areas. So, you know, in the, in the past, we've had drivers that would would take off and, and think that they were on their route and they would be either on somebody else's route or on a completely different route. So that, that training program has really helped uh, clean up our efficiency drivers. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we have the new protected bike lane, um, dedicated route, um, and then also wanted to touch on the long range forecast for this season. Um, I, I don't put a lot of weight into these long range forecasts, um, but but I think the, the local media has done a pretty decent job of, uh, you know, it, at least letting us know that there's the potential for a strong El Nino this year. Um, what that means for our area, we're kind of in a uh, in between areas really, but they're calling for mostly average to just above average snowfall for for our area this year. Um, and then uh, next slide, Daniel. Yeah. Um, I did also want to um, touch that we did hear some uh, feedback on our first snow uh, storm that we had a couple of weeks ago. Um, most of it was around the protected bike lanes um, on baseline and the protected intersection at 30th in Colorado. Um, it allowed us to identify um, some areas that, that we could make improvements um, and, and we've done such for the next snowstorm. Um, and we do plan to continue um, making changes and adjusting um, how we do things um, as we learn how those new facilities interact with the better weather. Um, and with that, um, I will close on the update for the season um, and open it up to Tab for any questions about this current snow season. Thank you, Scott. Any board members have any questions or feedback? I, oh, go ahead, Taylor. Taylor then, Ryan. Thank you. I am curious. I remember that a couple years ago we decided to plow, to stop plowing snow to the center of uh, major arterials because it was sort of bleeding into the travel lanes and then there were some motor vehicle crashes or boo-boos. Um, and then I think I remember from last season, Natalie said we were in on some in some places again plowing back to the center instead of clogging um the gutter and the bike lane. And do have have had as a city have we learned uh, how to optimize <laughs> where we scoop the snow? <laughs> Because I think we were playing around with in this last snow season, um, putting it back in the center median. Yeah, so we do that in in a couple areas um, that are particularly tight. Uh, the downtown area is one of those locations that we do plow to the center, um, and and it is an area that we can also after the snowstorm go back and actually take a snowblower and remove that snow from the downtown area. Um, so it, we we aren't funded for um, staff to be able to do that across the city. Um, and what we do experience with the snow cloud to the center is that you'll get that freeze back that we often see in, in bike lanes. Um, uh, Folsom uh, being a good example of that, that we've had some, some challenges around freeze back um, from night to night. Um, and, with that, we try to keep that snow plow to the outside. We do, uh, when temperatures are favorable, return with our trucks to pull that snow away from those bike lanes and get those opened up 
and actually pull it out into the traffic lanes to, to melt. Um, so, but that obviously takes favorable conditions. Snow has to stop. The travel lanes have to be mostly clear. Uh, but we do um, strive to keep some of that bike lane clear even when we're storing snow there. Teal, is that it for you? Alex Mann? Scott, thanks. Um, two questions. Uh, first one is, um, I am trying to remember the history of uh, over the last couple of years, uh, our discussion on updating a, kind of like a strategic plan for this, for the Snow and Ice Response Program. If I'm not mistaken, we had started a process and there was some feedback that we'd received or that, that your team had received. And if I'm, I think there wasn't, we haven't really got like an analysis of that yet in like a, a wider plan. I could be misremembering, but can you just remind me, is that is that the case? Was there like a strategic sort of plan update that involved community feedback? Forgive me if I'm uh, forgetting some key milestones. No, no, that's that's fine, Ryan. Um, we're pretty confusing uh, this month. That's in the next uh, part of the presentation. So I'm going to hand that over ah. to you. Um, Ben, Ben Annabog and Daniel Sheeter, and they will give a comprehensive presentation on the uh, analysis. Sorry, okay, I missed the table of contents for the agenda. Okay, excuse me. Thank you. I'll 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 uh, desist. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Anything else before we hear from others? Okay, probably best to hear from others so we have the complete picture. All right, sounds great. Well, um, with that then, thank you very much, Tab. Um, I will pass it along to Ben Manabal to start into the analysis presentation. Thanks, Scott. Good evening, Chair and Board members. My name is Ben Manabal, he, him, and I am a project manager uh, with uh, Public Works Business Services taking over this project for Noreen Walsh, uh, who has retired from the city. Um, to ground us back into what uh, what this pro uh, program review is, uh, is, a, is to take a step back and um, in another way, like in an exercise of standardization, um, what uh, in response to some of the things that we've heard in the community, which we'll uh, discuss in the next slide. Um, and then also understanding what other folks uh, in the region are doing uh, with their snow and ice clearing. Um, and then uh, after that, uh, what are the steps we need to make to uh, implement uh, these possible changes? Um, the uh, one thing to note for this is that uh, we are looking at specifically stuff uh, maintained by the Transportation and Mobility Department. So we work with a number of amazing uh, agency partners, both within the city and uh, other folks uh, outside, including the county, the state, uh, CU Boulder um, transit agencies uh, to uh, keep things clear in the winter. Um, but the stuff we'll be talking about today is uh, the stuff by uh, us and our department. Uh, you'll see the timeline at the bottom of the slide here. Uh, we are getting towards the end of this project uh, where we are, uh, we have a number of uh, uh, proposed recommendations that will be going to uh, the community after uh, the TAP presentation here. And uh, after that, then we'll be looking to finalize some of those and work towards um, implementing those, uh, which will include a, um, a look at future budgets and a budget request. Uh, Daniel, next slide, please. Uh, so from that previous timeline, uh, we had uh, a first go at hearing from uh, different folks um, out in the Boulder community on how they experience uh, the transportation system uh, in the winter and how, uh, and how that is affected by the way that we clear snow. Uh, so we had a number of different uh, channels of communication. Uh, some of those included uh, online um, uh, based uh, an open house. Uh, some um, as well as a survey and uh, also connecting with uh, 
kind of more focused groups, including the community connectors and residents uh, to kind of uh, dive deeper into, um, uh, to see if there was things that we weren't hearing. Uh, on the right hand side, um, just to summarize some of the things that we did hear, uh, it were kind of broken down by the way that folks traveled as you might expect. Uh, if you don't uh, use uh, some of the bike infrastructure, you're not gonna um, kind of see how that's affected by uh, ice that's kind of um, melted and refrozen on the ground. And same goes on the flip side, uh, if you're not driving, then that's uh, not something you experience. And so that's kind of, those were uh, kind of broken, um, kind of broken up and you can read more about that uh, in one of the attachments that kind of goes into much uh, deeper detail on how those kind of uh, um, played out. Some of the other, some of the things that we heard on uh, more generally uh, as themes uh, was uh, asking the city to uh, look at, take a uh, heightened focus to uh, themes around equity, uh, themes around, um, uh, you know, traveling uh, in different ways that were outside of the car, multimodal, um, and then also all around the way that uh, the city communicates about the program, both uh, in the way that um, and both we report like how we're doing and uh, and report and in reporting how, um, you know, like when we're actually going to be out on the roads, you know, like when is my street going to be plowed, that kind of a uh, um, frame of reference. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, in kind of taking uh, the feedback that we've heard, uh, we revisited our program purpose and goals uh, to uh, see if they still aligned, which for the most part they did. However, um, making some tweaks with some of that feedback, which uh, as I kind of uh, just mentioned, uh, that focus on uh, equity and uh, multimodal travel, and also in that kind of communication piece on um, you know, how are we using, uh, you know, what kind of data are we collecting and is, um, is that message or kind of the things that we're learning from that data um, getting implemented in our operations and then both, uh, then also, uh, communicated out to uh, folks in the community. Next slide, please. Uh, so to frame the way that, uh, you know, the city may approach uh, uh, clearing snow and ice uh, is breaking it down by how big the storm uh, is going to be or the, the snow event. Um, and, uh, so in front of you is showing as a small, medium, and large uh, in, uh, you know, in the idea of trying to make this as uh, easy to understand for folks that aren't uh, in the snow clearing business. Um, and you've kind of got the uh, inch totals and we'll kind of go into this in more detail as we um, go on in this presentation. But the, the reason to break these down is that uh, we can um, scale our approach and the resources that we apply uh, out onto our transportation system uh, in level with uh, the kind of snow we're expecting to see. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then as I go this over, uh, if uh, you remember the most recent snow that we had uh, a couple weeks ago, um, that would be around uh, the size of medium for the purposes of this, um, this presentation. Uh, so We'll be breaking this kind of table down um, section by section. This was uh, provided to us by um, the consultant Olson Associates that's working with us on this. Um, and this is a way that we could communicate uh, what kind of service and, you know, um, and plowing uh, folks can expect uh, either on their streets, on their paths, uh, transit areas, bike infrastructure, et cetera. Um, and uh, and then on the bottom, just to note, because it may be harder to read, there's a little asterisk for the shoveled areas. And that's more um, highlighting that uh, uh, adjacent properties to any kind of uh, sidewalk, uh, an existing part of our code is to, for those to be cleared within 24 hours. And that's more by the either the residential or commercial property owners, just that that's an existing um, uh, part of our regulations right now. Um, Next slide, and uh, Daniel Sheeter from our department will be taking over from this part. Great, thanks, Ben. 
Good evening, TAB members. My name is Daniel Sheeter, Principal Transportation Planner in the Planning Division. Um, I'll begin by diving into the pros proposed criteria for each of the program components, streets, multi-use paths, bike network, and shoveled areas that you kind of saw on the, on the overall program graphic that um, Ben just shared. Um, the recommended data-driven criteria was influenced by community feedback, including what we heard at TAB um, when we came in the early part of this year um, to align to better align with mode share objectives in the TMD and is broken out with mode specific considerations, be that transit, driving, biking, or walking. Um, so beginning with streets and small storms up to three inches, um, first priority criteria are all street segments that are high traffic, um, serve critical highway and arterial emergency response routes and or serve uh, high ridership transit routes with stops with greater than 50 boardings and alightings per day. And those would be cleared of snow within 12 hours after snow stops under this proposed um, storm size approach. Um, streets directly accessing RTD via BVSD bus facilities would, would also have service so that uh, transit can get in and out of, in and out of those yards. Um, and this next series of slides, um, and you should, you received a link to this presentation in the packet for this meeting. Um, and it's kind of an interactive um, presentation uh, so that we could embed these, these maps and um, you all can, can also manipulate these um, on your own devices. Um, and what you're seeing here is the left side, um, if you toggle for some of these, toggle the legend on gives you, gives you some more context there, but it, you're seeing on the left side of this map, the existing routes, in this case, under the old framework, primary routes. Um, and then on the right-hand side, recommended routes, which under the proposed uh, storm size approach would be first priority routes. And you can swipe back and forth and zoom, zoom in on this um, to kind of compare, uh, compare um, the existing program and the recommended changes. Um, these maps are best viewed on devices with larger screens, but they do also function on, on phones and tablets. Um, and uh, you can also go full screen with them with this expand button. So um, not to detract from the screen share here, but you can also follow along um, uh, the presentation and, and kind of zoom in on details as uh, we go through these slides and, and get to the Q&A. Um, so that is the, uh, the first priority streets um, for small storm. I'll then toggle to medium storms for streets. Um, and so for these larger storms or medium sized storms, um, first priority streets, um, uh, receive pre-treatment and would continue to be cleared uh, by 12 hours after snow stops. Um, but during these medium snow events between three and eight inches, second priority streets begin to see service here and would be cleared of snow by 24 hours after snow stops. So the proposed data-driven criteria here for second priority include all remaining critical emergency response routes, um, all remaining transit routes that um, have have less utilized or um, lower utilization for their for their stops, lower ridership, uh, the remaining critical emergency response routes, and then we begin to incorporate um, steeper streets, and these would be the the steepest in the city with grades of over six point five percent. And now you can see on the slide over map here um, those. Those routes that we saw on the preceding slide are kind of faded into the background here. And you can see the, the secondary routes from the existing program are the second priority routes under this, this, these proposed changes, these recommended changes overlaid on top in the bolder colors. Um, and so you can, you can again, compare uh, and contrast the, um, the changes. So moving on to large storms now, that third tier of storms, which is any storm greater than eight inches, um, first and second priority streets would continue to be cleared um, as they went under, under smaller storms, but third priority streets are proposed to be added, which consist of street segments with grades between 4% and 6.5%. And so these third priority streets would be clear 48 hours after snow stops. Um, and of course, for this icon for before storm means that, again, that for forecasted large storms, um, transportation and mobility crews would apply pretreatment to those first and priority, um, first and second priority streets. 
Um, and again, that uh, uh, those third priority streets are are emphasized on both of these maps, and you can see they primarily, given the criteria being driven by street grades, are on the western side of the city, um, with some exceptions. So before transitioning to multi-use paths and the bike network, um, I'd like to introduce a new bike route designation that was developed to be an input to the bike criteria for the proposed storm size approach. Um, so this, we're calling these crosstown bikeways and they're bike facilities that are tagged um, specifically with this designation to create a network of primarily low stress principal bike routes that utilize a combination of existing on-street bike facilities and multi-use paths. So a combination of on and off-street facilities. Um, the routes provide access to key destinations such as neighborhood centers, schools, parks and open space, job centers, and CU campuses. So for the proposed changes to the snow and ice response program, identifying these crosstown bikeways was critical to identify gaps in the existing plow network and improve connections between on and off street facilities and allow us to prioritize our, our resources for the program. The routes are preliminary and will be updated based on feedback and as well as the completion of planned capital projects as those are implemented in the coming years. And it, this won't, the pro, we plan to not just um, keep this within the snow and ice program. Um, it will also be utilized for an upcoming update to the bike map and potentially other transportation mobility programs and projects as well. Um, so that provides some context as we dive into first multi-use paths. Um, and so uh, there are not major changes proposed to service on multi-use paths, as Ben mentioned, um, the feedback we received on on, on clearing snow for multi-use paths was, was relatively positive and, and we'll, we propose to continue to maintain all 36 path miles that um, are maintained by transportation and mobility. And there are about 90 path miles total in the city, but um, other entities maintain those remaining miles, including Parks and Rec and CU and private property owners as well. But specifically for the, the lines that you see lit up on this map, um, uh, there would be no change to service there, but we are recommending um, a data-driven approach, data approach to prioritize service on highly utilized paths. And so this would include off-street segments of those crosstown bikeways that I just mentioned. And then given that our bike data um, citywide is not comprehensive, you know, those eco-counter loops that you see in some locations, it's not comprehensive citywide. Um, for the time being, we're leaning on... Um, Strava data here, but filtering it to just um, um, rides that are tagged as commutes. Um, and we've done some sensitivity analysis of, of, of this to kind of land on uh, the threshold there that is shown in the table um, at 3,500 annual Strava commutes, but it allows us to kind of take a citywide, uh, citywide data source for utilization of the path network and, and on-street network, as you'll see in a second. Um, core arterial network paths would also be a first, are proposed to be a first priority, and then all remaining paths would be second priority. And so, um, again, this just establishes a data-driven um, framework um, using using these data sets and, and mirrors, you know, what we've done for streets and what you'll see um, for the on-street bike network in a minute. And here, this is just outlining, this table is outlining the response time um, for first and second priority path segments, um, and that they vary by storm size, um, similar to the way that they do for streets. Um, but you know, for any storm, all 36 miles of paths that transportation and mobility maintains would, would have snow cleared from them um, for all storms. So the city's multi-use paths are an important component of the overall night bike network, but they provide limited connectivity on their own. And so using the proposed criteria for on-street bike facilities, um, those would be you know, anything from a neighborhood green street all the way up to a protected bike lane that, that exists on street. Um, the recommended changes um, propose 83% of the network, on-street network, 
to be cleared according to storm size, which marks about a 4% increase over the existing program. And the recommended criteria you see there in the table focuses on core arterial streets for all small storms, which includes the city's protected bike lanes on baseline 30th and Colorado and Folsom, and potential future corridors as well would be added to that. Um, and second, the second, pri second priority criteria includes on-street segments of the aforementioned crosstown bikeways and street segments with more than 700 annual Strava commutes. Um, these selections help staff better connect um, on-street facilities and multi-use paths, enabling plow service to be added to many key street segments to create, a, to create continuous bike routes that utilize multiple facility types. Please note that additional segments of the bike network are plowed if covered under transit and driving criteria. So this map you see on the right is not all-encompassing. You might find segments that... Um, that uh, do fall under other criteria, but this really demonstrates the criteria, the bike specific criteria you see on the left-hand side of your screen there. Um, and again, this has that same slide over feature showing the existing program in blue with the blue lines here and the um, recommended changes um, to plow routes or street seeing plow service with the green lines. And then just to reiterate kind of what Scott mentioned at the start of the presentation, um, Protected bike lane and intersection design can vary significantly in materials and, and design or location. Um, so for example, some of our protected bike lanes are street level and others are sidewalk level. Uh, the type of vertical separation can also affect operations. And so as a result, Snow and Ice Response requires tailoring service to each specific facility and deploying specialized plows and in some cases even contracted shoveling to clear snow. Um, and the department recently recently procured a specialized small plow to clear snow from existing protected bike lanes and intersections. But as additional facilities are constructed in the future through the department's capital projects, additional resources and equipment may be needed, may be needed to maintain a high level of service for the bike network. So the final program component is shoveled areas. And so these are areas that are small, um, you know, really small or constrained spaces where using the larger snow clearing equipment is not feasible. Um, so the, what does that encompass? Uh, these are select curb ramps, median refuge islands, and bus stop platforms that are cleared by um, contractors. And so there are currently about 156, or there are 156 of these locations, 41 of which are transit stops. And then we also have some um, additional transit stops that are serviced by volunteers through the city's shovel a stop program, um, which represents about an additional 38 transit stops, bringing the total number of cleared transit stops under the existing program to 79. And so the proposed criteria in the table uh, focuses those contractor resources at high and moderate ridership transit stops, as well as high use crossings. Um, and then um, Third priority not shown here would be all transit stops uh, with low ridership of less than 35 riders per day. And to kind of drill down into those bus stops in a little bit more detail, um, this map shows the existing 79 stop, while well, this really shows um, both existing and recommended. And so the 79 stops that currently have snow removal fall under um, shovel a stop and currently cleared by contractor. We also have a number of stops cleared by other agencies in yellow, CU um, and RTD specifically. And then using that data-driven criteria um, and to better meet um, the program's um, proposed purpose and goals, the changes would recommend it that an additional 36 stops be cleared with contractors, which would be an 8% increase in cleared stops compared to the existing program and would result in all stops with more than 35 riders per day being cleared of snow, which um, totals out to about 40% of all 556 total stops in the city. Um, and uh, we're currently at just, about, just over 30% cleared. So the, the recommended changes and the criteria um, propose a, a, a meaningful increase there and in, in bus stop clearance. Um, and so at this point, that wraps up the program components. I'll turn it back over to Ben to present the remaining slides. 
Thanks, Daniel. Uh, after applying all of this uh, criteria, then staff uh, took a look at this resulting um, kind of coverage of our transportation network and went through a process of a, uh, of a screening or does this make sense? Uh, and does this uh, kind of meet the city's more overall goals around racial equity? And uh, there's a number of different ways that we did this. Um, one of those was kind of mentioned back earlier where in some of our um, community engagement uh, previously did and uh, future plan, which we'll get into um, connecting with uh, our uh, community connectors and residents and uh, other, um, other community groups to kind of delve deeper into how people experience our system. Uh, also, uh, taking a look at how this affects uh, our manufactured home communities and other major um, Boulder housing project properties to make sure that folks can um, kind of connect into the rest of the system. Um, and then what you see in front of you is uh, another way we screened, which was through, um, through the city's racial equity index. And so uh, as a reminder that uh, racial equity index uh, is something that takes census block groups, which are kind of geographically roughly 600 to 3000 people and uh, takes a number of factors, including uh, race and uh, socioeconomic factors like, uh, uh, like your income and things like that and uh, puts them together into an indice uh, a rating from one to five on the leftmost column of this table. And uh, so then the uh, highest priority or the five in this case are uh, areas of the city that, um, that are the most racially diverse and or the most economically diverse. And when taking a look at our existing program and the recommended program using this, uh, all of these new criteria that Daniel just explained, um, we, uh, we were hoping to, or we were looking at, uh, we want this to not be a detriment to um, those that need our services the most. And uh, kind of if you move to the, uh, for this right column of this table, you see that um, there's an increase in the uh, amount of the uh, transportation, transportation system uh, cleared of snow and ice uh, for those that are of the highest priority uh, in our racial equity index. Um, and this is something that uh, as we uh, fine tune or make any changes to our program, we can always check back into kind of these different methods to see how we're doing with that. Uh, next slide, please, Daniel. So we went through quite a number of different topics. And so this is a slide that we can get back to and talk over, um, but this is uh, just kind of everything in summary that we've talked about and uh, a, a kind of something to reiterate was um, with our new or with this kind of proposed recommendations, uh, we end up with a, a increase in uh, the number of lane miles or the number, the number of uh, the amount of street that we're servicing, as well as the amount of our on-street bike network and an increase in the number of transit stops that would be covered um, with, uh, with snow and ice clearing. Uh, but we can always get back to this since this, there's a lot of information on here. Uh, next, uh, please. So when, after we go back to the community and see uh, you know, does these changes meet their expectations and as we make tweaks, uh, we are gonna be looking towards how do we implement these things. And so uh, when we do that, we will go to city council and ask for some sort of a budget request. Um, if we increase the amount of uh, infrastructure that we're servicing, uh, that money needs to come from either, some, needs to come from somewhere. Um, and so then to uh, kind of uh, you know, ground us into what kind of order of magnitude uh, you know, do these uh, impacts make? Um, uh, Scott said earlier, our adopted budget this last year or this current year is uh, 1.84 million. And uh, when we're thinking about how much, um, you know, some of the, uh, the resources that we need to clear streets like plows um, shown on the bottom there, uh, you know, that, that also requires uh, labor and people power. And so uh, for each, um, 
for each snowplow, if we were to purchase, then we need two folks to operate that. Um, and uh, just something to ground us in and uh, stuff that staff has in the back of our heads as we're um, kind of moving towards some kind of implementation. Um, stuff we can talk about as we go along. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, with, this is a, the timeline on the right is a repeat from uh, earlier in the presentation. So we're here at our second round of engagement or at the beginning of um, starting with a tab presentation here. And we are going to go out again with another um, on-demand open house, uh, both in English and Spanish uh, to explain all the stuff that you've seen here today. Um, also, we will be reaching out and uh, meeting with a number of community partners. Uh, you know, they are listed kind of here to um, kind of further our understanding of uh, the impacts of the recommendations we're making. And uh, we will be, um, you know, once we have kind of a more finalized set of recommendations, uh, and as we move towards some sort of, some sort of budget request, um, we'll have a third round of engagement kind of at the end there. Uh, of this upcoming spring. And so we have the three questions for the board uh, that were included in the memo and then up here on the screen. Um, and we are open for uh, discussion and questions. Thank you, Ben and Daniel. Um, any tab members have any questions or responses to these questions that are posed to us for Ben, Daniel, or Scott? I'll, I'll just have something. Sure. So um, I'll start with the questions and then I'll, and then uh, if you, uh, so I can then answer these. Um, Daniel, um, where did I go here? I have uh, just a few quick questions. One, um, I, I, I was trying to follow the very end there on the budget, it, what the changes represented, um, and I'm not sure, but could, maybe could you just comment on the, what is the change in the, the budget for this? And then also, um, relatedly, is it kind of a, a zero sum with respect to the change from where we were to where we do with respect to we have to take away parts to get parts? Or is there a chance that you found any kind of efficiency improvements with respect to how resources are used? Just just, just curious. I might let Ben or Scott respond to that first. Um, I can fill in, fill in for them after. But Ben, feel free to take a crack at that first. Sure. So, I'm also, I'm also yeah, happy yeah. to jump in to however helpful. <laughs> Thanks, Natalie. So, um, and and I'll, I offered that because um, we didn't have the financials uh, completed at this point, but we thought it was important to come and get your feedback um, before this, you know, got further along and kind of the financial analysis piece of the work. So we don't have, you know, what the financial impacts going to be with the recommended recommendations or the recommended changes, um, but we'll be working on that next. Um, and, and it's it's not so much zero sum. I think you know, obviously, everything's a trade off. So um, it's not necessarily zero sum within the snow and ice program, but it's zero sum with you know within the transportation fund. Um, and so as we um, look to invest more in snow and ice maintenance, then that means it has to come from some other thing that we would spend money on in the transportation fund. Got it. Okay. Alex, I could, that was my one question. I have comments, but should I defer to Teal or others with questions first? You can do comments now too. Okay, great. Um, okay. So I did the question. That was your, the first question. Was there a question? Um, what additional information? Uh, so I think this is, um, yes. On question number two, does the snow nice response review draft for me? What additional information is what recommend staff share? Um, so I guess maybe I'll blend the answer to that question and, and my just general comments. Um, so I'm curious to hear what my other, my colleagues said, but I, I feel like this is a really incredible presentation. And um, I, I really, a few things that I, I really 
value here. One is um, the data, the, the you know some of the, some of the some of the corridors that I mentioned didn't, didn't, didn't appear, but I you know D Daniel, as you described, you you've got a data driven approach here, and um, that is using the logic of the whole system of the city. And I just I, I don't I can't think of seeing another presentation like this that that looked at the whole city as a system, used data to to drive it. Um, and I just I'm I'm really pleased to see that here, and I'd love to see that repeated. Um, and secondly, the use of the technology with um, presentation. I, this is really I, just really helpful for, um, I think, people to see and comprehend and just a really great presentation. And then finally, um, I, I, I understand some of the work on the um, with respect to equity and community engagement is still ongoing, but um, I would just compliment so far on what seems to be a, 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 um, a pretty, um, pretty thoughtful approach. And also, I think this looks like a really good example of using uh, an equity analysis to consider the status quo and how the status quo can can change and needs to change. Um, and I think that's great. Um, so that's that was my comments. Um, my my only suggestion, and I think it says maybe get to the third question, is um, I would be interested to you know get, uh, recognizing that the budget is has some limit and there's we're not going to be able to get everything done. That um, we just you know, however this lands, that you're able to flag and, and write down the th things that are outstanding that we're not getting to from a standpoint of accessibility and inclusion, uh, especially with respect to um, feedback from Center for People with Disabilities and the disability community, um, so that so the city council and the public can see that and see that what we're not doing. And, you know, I, ideally that would come with some direction on resources needed to address it or, or what a next step would be. Um, but you know, I, I, that might that might be a whole level of analysis you can't do. So at least leaving you know some sort of remainder um, when you're done with this, and, and um, I would expect some of that to include sidewalk considerations that may be outside the scope of this, but from the standpoint of the public, seems to be related. So um, that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Teal. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to chime in and say that uh, I, I really, I was also very impressed with the analysis that I saw. Like this was kind of a really great example of data-driven analysis and decision-making. Uh, and I, in particular, like the project's revised purpose and goals. I think that's, that's getting much better, uh, wrapping our arms around much better what we ought to be uh, looking for in terms of how to frame some community frustration that the that the street right outside their um, house is not getting um, plowed as quickly as they want. I think this is really, really good. And in particular, this um, sort of joint framework about how serious the snow is and how critical the street is, is a really great way to frame it. I kind of like the um, the graphic with that, that three by three year um, chart. So, um, on the data bit, I am leery about using the Strava data. Uh, I think it's probably useful. Uh, should not be all that we use, and 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 you know, it might not be all that we use. So I'd be interested in hearing other other things like Strava data. But Strava bills itself as sort of a a workout, um, a an exercise based, a, a, a physical challenge kind of based um, app. And so it's really great that they have a um, a commuter thing, but that is not what most Strava users use it for. I mean, I'm looking at their their homepage right now, record, sweat, share, kudos. It's, it's to share your workout goals and stuff. Um, and so to the extent we have other things to draw on about where, how people are using, uh, especially the multi-use paths, um, I'm reminded, or I, if I recall correctly, our terms of service with at least the Lime scooters and possibly or not um, V-Cycle um, includes the city's ability to access and utilize anonymized user data about where they're going. Um, are we also, are we using that for this purpose to the extent that we're, you know, relying on Strava to tell us where cyclists want to go? Are we also looking at where Lime Scooter users and B-Cycle users want to go? 
That's a great suggestion, Tila. We did not map that um, <clears throat> as we were developing criteria, mm -hmm. but um, I know uh, I I know we I, I well maybe the scooter team. I know Valerie maybe could speak to some of the data we're beginning to receive from um, from Lime on the scooter side um, and yeah. kind of how that's being collected by the city or viewable by the city. But I think it's a great place where we could we could potentially take a pass at that. Um, and see if we could access that for the purposes of kind of comparing that to the Strava data and, and agree with some of your concerns um, about yeah. that data set. Um, we, in it wasn't the only criteria proposed here, and we did kind of use it to validate both our our identification of those crosstown bikeways I mentioned, as well as check it against our eco counters. You know, our 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 location it's specific counters. in street counters. Uh -huh. Yeah, where where they exist to confirm that. Um, kind of matches up with what we're seeing at those spot mm -hmm. locations and also is consistent with um, those kind of principal bike routes that we want to focus service on um, network-wide. Um, but point taken on on Strava as a platform and, and um, as a data yeah. source there. Yeah. I mean, it's great that you're using it, but I would just like to think about other ways that we can, you know, pull similar data from other sources because Strava is definitely not <laughs> a great way to show what everyday cyclists are, yeah. um, you know, expecting to find or expecting to go. Yeah. Um, huh. Yes. I, I just want to add, I mean, I, I, I agree with you that most <laughs> people on Strava are athletes and at the same time, I know that there's a, there's a division of Strava called Metro which provides this data to a lot of cities and planners and just, it's very, very useful. So I, what I would suggest instead of like overlooking, you know, the positive things that they could bring to the table is that we also consider all of the athletic rides, right? Because I use Strava on a regular basis and whether I'm commuting or not, I'm not like specifying where I'm going or what I'm doing. I mean, I just, you know, right. it's not something that I like really take the time to do. But I am on the platform and I use it all the time. And so right. maybe just think about it like that too, just not eliminating rides that could potentially be commute because they're not labeled as such. Because they're not tagged that way. Yeah, that's that's useful. I did not know about uh, Metro. That's great, Trini. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, like what we don't want to do is... Um, just get everything from one Clear story. a road for leisure riders who are not going to go out if it's icy or snowy. Uh, and no, I think that's why that's really why the B cycle data and the line data might be, you know, very useful is because those are shorter utility trips. Generally, no, one, no one's trying to get a workout on those B cycle bikes. Yep. Um, so I wanted to raise that. Um, second thing. Uh, I forgot. Third thing. I'll go back to the second thing, I'm sure. Uh, third thing is, as I recall. Uh, I think right at the end of Bill Cowern's um, term as uh, as director, it was it was like the snowiest. Uh, Boulder was the snowiest city in America one one winter. <laughs> Bill Cowern was at the helm, um, and we had one really heavy late season dump of snow, and that single snowfall, as I recall we had to ask for extra money and something on the order of four and a half thousand or uh, four hundred fifty thousand dollars for a single snow event. And so I recognize that 1.8 million is a nice big uh, bump up from 1.4 million. Um, it, but at the time when that extra expenditure got, you know, blessed and, and, and authorized, I think Sam Weaver was the mayor at the time. And he said, you know, climate change is coming. These snow events are going to get larger more frequent and more severe. And so I think it would do staff well in framing budget discussions going forward to say, this is likely to become an even bigger ticket item every year. Um, recognizing we've already, you know, bumped up requests to reflect inflation in, in the price of, of asphalt and concrete and things, the likelihood of having really big um, snow events that are quite expensive to manage is going to be something for city council to wrestle with. Do we maintain current community expectations about how quickly and how responsively 
city staff clears the streets or do we tell them, you know, you're going to have to um, accept a little worse condition on the road because weather patterns are getting worse. Um, but I do think it would be worth your while staff to lay the groundwork for asking more and more money or asking more and more forgiveness, um, more and more money either to keep keeps things at, at, at the standards that the, that the community has come to expect or forgiveness for not being able to keep up with that because um, like the atmosphere is actually conspiring against us. Um, the third thing just flashed into my head and then it went back out. Oh, here it is. Um, for minor snow events, uh, the one to three inches, I am curious, obviously we're doing preparation ahead of these snow events based on a, the forecast, right? And we're anticipating how much snow there is based on the forecast, which are getting really delightfully accurate, um, not perfect. But I'm wondering if in any of the decision to pre-treat or how frequently to plow during events, if there's any um, attention paid to what the forecast is post the snow event. So if it's a one to three inch snowfall and yet the uh, forecast temperature two days from now is 65 degrees, I would think the city would be highly justified in doing almost nothing to clear the snow um, on anything but the most critical routes. Uh, whereas if there's a moderate snow event and the forecast says the temperature is not expected to exceed freezing for four or five days and there's a good likelihood of another snow event, um, we might uh, expect a different response um, or be more forgiving of, of, the, um, of the city response. Is there any um, leeway in the plan right now about what the forecast post a snow event is? There isn't currently any consideration for after storm. Um, I think one thing that would benefit us from a warm up immediately after the storm is that that 24 hours or 12 hours um, will be reduced because of those uh, increase in temperatures. Um, and our after storm cleanup will be much quicker as well. Um, as far as for the opposite, and you know, if there's snow expected two days later and, and incredibly cold temperatures. The plan itself doesn't take that into account, uh, but staff will. Um, so it, it, we, we do that in our current approach that if we know that there's an additional eight inch storm coming after an eight inch storm, we're more likely to move things closer to the outside, allow ourselves some more room, because we know there's going to be additional snowfall that we need to store. But that, 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 is, that is a good consideration too. We'll, we'll include that in our, our considerations. Yeah, I, I mean, I hesitate to, uh, to, to make the storm response too formulaic and to um, remove some of the human judgment you just described. Um, I think one overarching and, and I think Ryan touched on this one overarching like theme is that this there was some very real world practical thinking that went into this. I, I just commend you on um, the thinking and the preparation and the the sophistication of um, the planning that I'm seeing in this this document. I think it's pretty great. Congratulations. Thank you, Tila. Trini, did you have anything? If not, it looks like Becky does. Becky, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to echo what um, others have said about um, that it's like really well communicated and presented, and I think will be super helpful for people to understand whether or not the the street they're thinking about, um, you know, is on the map. I think it's it's yeah, really really well communicated um, in the visuals too. Even like the credit card and water bottle size of um, how how much snow there is. You know, that's all really great. Um, and uh, also the the kind of crosstown bikeways piece that is like a so my understanding is that's that's a so that's a new 
sort of designation. Is that right? Yeah. Um, let's, you know, and always, always appreciate when a project can develop something that's then, you know, able to inform other work. So, um, so that's a really neat aspect of this as well. Um, so I don't have, I don't have uh, many, much else in the way of comments, though. I do have, I'm sorry to ask one budget question, because I know you said that, Natalie, that the budget, you know, piece isn't, um, is fully known yet. But I, I'm curious if this framework would, the way that it prioritizes uh, different areas um, based on the conditions discussed, if that prioritization would then be used to scale the program if like the full budget amount wasn't available, or if that would be kind of a different set of considerations. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm happy to just comment on that. I, I mean, I think that's an interesting idea. I'm not sure if the team has gotten that far to um, consider the using that kind of prioritization to scale and kind of like phase um, some of these recommendations. Scott, do you have anything more to share on that? Yeah, yeah. So the, the way it is built is is very much that it's scalable. Um, so we can we can scale up um, with with this. We can scale down if we you know see times of um, staff turnover uh, and and staff issues. Um, we're able to go both ways with this, um, which is really um, has, has interested me along the way with this is just how scalable it is, actually. Great. Yeah, thank you um, for that response. And um, yeah, lastly, I can appreciate that <laughs> I certainly hadn't thought about it, but just the difference in all the different kinds of facilities and new facilities and how that affects, you know, needing to change operations and planning. So. Um, thank you for all the <laughs> work that goes into adapting um, to that. So, um, yeah, so it's a, a great project and uh, appreciate the presentation tonight. Yeah, I'll echo what we've heard from others. It's great to see how data driven this is, um, how network focused. It's the hearing about the new prioritized bike, cross down bikeways, making sure that those are providing important connections within the network um, is a, an approach that I like others I, I really appreciate and a very cool use of the mapping that was a really neat tool I've never seen utilized before being able to sort of live zoom in zoom out on mapping I'm curious to see how the city can continue to utilize that in the future and I think that'll be really beneficial in communicating with the community it's really clear what the expectations are transparent I think managing expectations with snow removals almost impossible, but um, if anyone were to spend some time trying to figure out what to expect, this would clearly communicate that that for them. So I think to your your second question here, what you've outlined is has really, I think is well aligned with the, the purpose and goals. I'm looking forward to see how this develops. And um, as we continue to build out more protected bicycle infrastructure, I hope there's some economies of scale of, you know, would be more network effect there where when, or one, segment ends another one picks up and so it's less of that time spent relocating specialty equipment but the specialty equipment has a network of its own just to to continue on so there's some long-term benefit as we build more out hopefully in the future but yeah very well done Tila did you have something else if oh. I if I may just for a second gush about um Scott and our maintenance team um you know I think we've been reflecting a lot lately just given the new infrastructure that um you know is different than a lot of cities have and that we've had in the past that require um just more innovative approach to maintaining our system um and Scott's been very open and innovative and just like willing to take on that challenge and he's cultivating a team that um, can also like appreciate that and be excited about that. I think, um, you know, historically and traditionally uh, public works, you know, and maintenance teams are not super excited about having a diversity of infrastructure on their systems. Um, and he and I spent a lot of time just talking about that and talking about how can we help people feel excited about getting to do this work in our city. So um, just wanted to give a little bit of praise to Scott. Thanks. Well done, Scott. Anything else from tab or a little behind schedule? Very worthwhile discussion, but if there's nothing else, we'll thank the team, Scott, Ben, and Daniel, and continue on with our agenda. Next up is agenda item seven, matters, first matters from city staff. 
Yes, thank you. And we do have one item tonight and Devin is back with us to give an update. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Let me share my screen. All right, good evening, Tab. Uh, my name is Devin Joslin. I'm the city's principal traffic engineer. And I'm excited to be here tonight to present an update on expansion of the photo enforcement program. Uh, I have with me tonight, um, not in a van, Joe Van, the photo enforcement supervisor, to answer any questions that I'm unable to about specific details about the photo enforcement program. Um, similar to what Natalie just said, I'm very proud of staff um, for hitting the ground running on this and really working hard to get this program expanded as quickly as possible um, in compliance with the law. It's really amazing that the law allowing for expansion of automated enforcement on two more types of streets was signed by Governor Polis into law in early June and staff from Transportation and Mobility, the Police Department and the City Attorney's Office are prepared to have City Council adopt a resolution early next month to designate corridors to allow for expanded automated enforcement within the city. Uh, to my knowledge, Boulder will be the first city in the state uh, to hopefully adopt a resolution designating corridors for automated enforcement. Um, there are a few things out of our control, which I'll explain later in the presentation, um, but we're not letting that slow us down. Uh, we're still advancing this important work. There are three main things uh, I wanna talk about tonight. Uh, the background of photo enforcement within the city of Boulder and the passage of SB uh, Senate Bill 23200, which allows for expansion of automated enforcement. The process staff used to determine corridors to designate as automated vehicle identification corridors in compliance with the new law and the next steps for what can be expected in 2024 in terms of program expansion. Um, some of you may know this already, uh, but I was actually somewhat surprised to learn um, that Boulder has had a photo traffic enforcement program uh, for 25 years, going all the way back to 1998. Um, but in those 25 years, the program has grown to include 180 plus neighborhood photo radar van deployment locations. Uh, there are five full-time and two part-time photo enforcement officers, two photo radar vans, and 11 red light running cameras. Um, so that's quite an impressive history, and we're excited to be adding to that history um, in this moment. Uh, we know from the Safe Streets report um, that one out of every three fatal and serious injury crashes between 2018 and 2020 involved speeding. Um, we know also from our review of crash data that speed-related crashes accounted for an average of seven severe and 65 total crashes per year um, from 2018 through 2022. And we know that Crash data indicates that 67% of all fatal and serious injury crashes within the city occurred on arterial, arterial roadways. Um, I do want to note and give thanks to uh, both City Council and the Transportation Advisory Board, who strongly supported the passage of Senate Bill 23200, um, recognizing that it was essential to achieving the city's Vision Zero goal. Um, within the Vision Zero Action Plan, you'll recall that um, that plan contains an action which is focused on strategically expanding deployment of automated vehicle identification systems, including both fixed and mobile speed enforcement where allowed by state law. And just as a refresher, um, prior to the passage of Senate Bill 23200, photo enforcement operations um, by the city of Boulder were restricted to residential neighborhood streets with speed limits of 35 miles per hour or less within school zones, adjacent to a park, or in active construction zones. Uh, with the passage of Senate Bill 23200, the Colorado Revised Statutes 
uh, 42.4.110.5.2G for those who uh, might be interested in the specific state statute. Um, that was amended and now allows for the expanded use of municipalities of automated vehicle identification systems on any street or portion of a street that has been designated as an automated vehicle identification corridor. And the law requires that corridors be designated by ordinance or resolution of its governing body. Um, I want to point out that there is uh, within Boulder Revised Code, um, 7474 is what authorizes the use of automated enforcement systems within the city. And the city attorney's office advised that no update was needed to the BRC in order to comply with the new law. Uh, for this reason, staff is asking city council to adopt a resolution to designate corridors as automated vehicle identification corridors. Uh, I'll talk briefly on this slide and the next few about the process uh, that we used to determine which corridors should be designated. Um, the new law requires that corridors be designated based on review of data collected within the past five years related to incidents of crashes, speeding, reckless driving, or community complaints of speeding on a street. Um, as such, transportation and mobility and police department staff reviewed crash data and calls to police dispatch regarding complaints of speeding or reckless driving. This data was used as a basis for determining which corridors should be designated uh, via resolution for city council. Uh, the city attorney's office was instrumental in writing the resolution and advising us on making sure that the data we reviewed was appropriate to determine the corridors to be designated. Uh, the city attorney's office also advised that state-owned corridors, uh, which are the portions of state highways that run through Boulder city limits, could be designated as automated vehicle identification corridors uh, at this time. Um, however, transportation and mobility staff will need to coordinate with CDOT and get concurrence on the final limits of the corridors before an automated enforcement can begin on state-owned corridors. Uh, and this is a 2024 work plan item for transportation and mobility staff. And I just wanna point out that the resolution is currently on the council calendar and on their consent agenda for the December 7th city council meeting. Um, the map on the left of this slide illustrates the location where crashes that were a result of exceeding the safe speed limit or traveling at 10 miles per hour or more above the posted speed limit uh, occurred within the most recent five year period from 2018 through the end of August, 2023. Uh, as can be seen, many of these crashes occur on the city's expressway, principal arterial and minor arterial streets and also those that have uh, some of our higher speed limits. The map on the right illustrates those same speed-related crashes in a heat map. Um, the map illustrates that there are speed-related crashes along the extents of the corridors that are recommended to be designated in the resolution. This map illustrates a heat map of speeding-related calls to police dispatch. This shows where community complaints of speeding have been noted. Um, you can see that there are clusters of calls at intersections along the arterial streets. But the map also illustrates that speeding concerns are reported across the entire city. Um, you can see also here that um, where there is the highest frequency of police related calls uh, about speeding um, correlate with the crash data um, as well. And these two things were very key considerations in determining the corridors we wanna designate. Um, so this map shows the corridors that will be designated by resolution as automated vehicle identification corridors. The dark blue line shows the city-owned corridors and the light blue line shows the state-owned corridors. And again, the state-owned corridors are ones where 
CDOT is in the process of developing guidelines um, for how they want to handle automated enforcement on state highways, and we're going to continue to coordinate with them on any steps necessary to formalize the designation of the state highway corridors in accordance with CDOT guidelines. Um, the other thing to point out on this slide is that um, the corridors that are not designated, um, specifically designated as automated vehicle identification corridors, those corridors can continue to be enforced um, because they are still in compliance with the law that they're on uh, residential neighborhoods, speed less than 35 miles per hour, um, so they don't specifically have to be designated in order for enforcement uh, to, to continue to occur. And then just uh, in full awareness for all, um, enforcement could occur anywhere uh, on the extents of a corridor that is designated uh, for automated enforcement. And then just wanted to point out as well uh, the correlation of the corridors that are designated to the location of our existing 11 red light running cameras, um, as well as the two cameras that are currently planned to be added. Um, and if you recall, those are at 28th Street and J Road for the southbound approach and Canyon Boulevard at 15th uh, for the westbound approach. Um, this is important because our red light running cameras can be used to enforce speeding at intersections if the functionality to do so is enabled. And this is one method of implementation that transportation and mobility and police department staff are considering uh, as a means of adding fixed speed cameras. And you'll note um, that the red light running camera at Broadway and Pine is the only location that is not on a state-owned corridor. Uh, in terms of the city council resolution, I mentioned earlier that that is on the December 7th um, city council consent agenda. And the resolution asks council to resolve two things, uh, to approve the expanded use of automated vehicle identification systems on Boulder streets, and to approve the designation of certain streets as automated vehicle identification corridors, noting that the specific extent of the designation on each portion of the state-owned corridors will be determined in consultation uh, with the Colorado Department of Transportation. Uh, so in terms of next steps, um, the intended outcomes of the photo enforcement program expansion are to reduce speed-related fatal and serious injury crashes, increase awareness of speed enforcement on Boulder streets, reduce speeding, and increase the sense of community safety. Um, in terms of program expansion, that is an ongoing process that will be initiated in 2024. Um, it's difficult at this time to estimate exactly when and how many sites will become operational immediately, uh, but this is something we'll keep you posted on. And again, just a reminder that we will be working with CDOT um, to finalize the designation and allow for deployment on those state-owned corridors. Uh, but that's what I had for my update, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thanks, Devin. Any questions, Trini? Hi, Devin. Thank you for your presentation. And yeah, it's been an incredible process and it's been so exciting to see that um, that this is actually coming to life and that we're pioneering this effort. But I guess I, I was kind of like shocked to see that we're going to have to like hold off until CDOT kind of clears the, the state owned roads. Um, so what do you think is the timeline is because Broadway is such a big issue, right? And all the way, like, there's a stretch of it, obviously, that is being taken care of, but the one that doesn't belong to us, per se, that's a huge problem. So it's just very, I, I don't know, it was kind of like, uh, you know, to see that that's going to be something that we're going to have to wait for. So do you have any idea what the timeline might be? 
I don't have an exact timeline. We've been in close um, communication with CDOT. They have been a little coy about the timing of their their guidelines and when they'll make them available. Um, but as soon as they do, it is something that we're ready to jump on and begin working with them um, to get those corridors uh, kind of formally designated to allow for enforcement to occur. And I just wanna give credit to the city attorney's office because um, they navigated some law for us and came to the interpretation that we are able to include those corridors in our resolution at this time, which saves us the trouble of having to either amend the resolution at a later date um, to add them in or to amend it to like be more specific about the extents of the corridors. So in that regard, we're set up well with the way the resolution's written that once we get the final concurrence from CDOT, we can begin enforcement right away. Is there any way that they that we could override because given that that's part of like our high impact network and really the the need, the high need, especially that particular stretch of Broadway in particular? I don't believe we can. I mean, it's something I could potentially re-explore with the city attorney's office, but there is um, a specific clause in the law that says the corridors also must be designated, you know, in collaboration or in consultation with the Colorado Department of Transportation. Well, thank you, Devin. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks, Devin. It's exciting to have this new enforcement tool in our toolbox. So hoping this gets implemented as swiftly as possible. Any other feedback or Tila questions from Tab? Yeah, thank you, Devin. You took some wind out of my sails because I was in open board comment or in the, the like next agenda. I was going to ask for this subject to be brought before us next month. So really happy to, to hear it. Um, uh, would you be willing to forward us the slides that you've used this evening? Sure. And I believe that a member of city staff is, they were scheduled to come to um, Community Cycles Advocacy Committee, I think this month on snow and ice removal. Uh, but from my recent speaking with them, they're actually much more interested in this subject. So I don't know if you would be available in December or January to come to CCAC mm. and talk to them. I'm sure they'll have some questions, but I think your the explanation tonight and the slides are probably going to answer most of their questions, but I would just like to extend uh, uh, <laughs> speaking out of turn because I don't speak for them, but um, <laughs> pretty sure they'd be interested in talking to you about this. So I hope um, you would be willing to, to meet with them and answer some further questions, but this is really, really exciting. I gather we are confident that city council will support the resolution. There's no action or, or, or nudging required by tab at the, at this time. Natalie might have more insight into that. I mean, at this point it is um, currently remains on the consent agenda, which usually right. means that it's not controversial. controversial and expected yep. to be adopted. Okay. Yep. Nothing, nothing other than what Devin said. Okay, great. Thank you. Good job. Happy to hear this. Just a quick writer on that. Does it is it helpful if you if you're able to say that the um, tab is supportive? I, don't, I mean, I don't know if there's a procedural way to do that, but um... oh well, that is a good point, Ryan. Um, there is a section we are including a memo, like a cover memo to council that will explain in a little more detail, similar to what I did tonight, the data and the process that we use to designate the corridors, and the uh, the resolution then gets attached to that memo. But there is a section within that memo that points out, did we bring it to the board? What was their feedback? So in that sense, I think, yes, a, a formal feedback or not of approval from TAB might be helpful, but I don't know if that can be done in this um, matters from staff format or not. So. Right, point of order. We can't make any formal action at the moment, but uh, I am on record as a personal member of TAB as being in support of this. And it sounds like Trini was, it sounds like Ryan is, and I'm curious if other members of the board might say something like that. 
believe I've supported this in the past on the record and will continue to. Yes, I am also supportive. <laughs> Do with that what you can or wish. <laughs> Great. That's Thanks, all Devin. we, yeah, that's all we had under matters tonight. Thanks. Cool. We'll move on to matters from the board. I think the only thing on our agenda is Becky's update on updating parking. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so I have been doing outreach to other boards, board members, uh, members of other boards, I should say. Um, so addressing our request to council around updating the off-street parking rules and uh, ordinances. And um, so I about wrapped that up. We have 28, maybe 29 folks signed on from 10 different boards. Um, so I'm really, really pleased about that. Um, I think it's great to show that this issue is, you know, not, definitely not just a transportation issue or a housing issue. It's really affects a lot of areas that boards work on. Um, one example being, you know, our water resources and all the water infrastructure and how excess runoff and polluted runoff affects that. And so just getting the support from a lot of different boards helps kind of illustrate that it's a broader, you know, it's a much broader issue and therefore, you know, more more incentive for council to take it up and and really seriously consider it and try to get it done um, within their, within the framework of their next, um, sort of uh, prior agenda priorities. Um, I Just to give you a little insight on, for folks who didn't sign on, from what I know, um, mostly, in most cases, people just didn't respond to my email. So I don't, that's not really a yes or no. It just, you know, I just didn't hear back. Um, there were a few folks who just felt like they didn't, they didn't know enough. They wanted to learn more before they would feel ready. Um, there were, um, there were a few people who were definitely interested in revising the rules, but not ready to say for sure they wanted to eliminate all parking minimums. Uh, so that's not, you know, not surprising either. So and each of these was just like maybe a couple people each. Um, and then lastly, there were maybe two or three folks who felt like they couldn't comment on something that wasn't brought to them formally in a meeting. Um, in some cases that was, expressed as a preference. And in some, in one case, somebody said they were told that. So I don't know who told them that because that was one of the sort of challenges of doing this outreach is people felt like they couldn't speak to it. And I would try to explain that, yes, you can as an individual board member, you know, you can endorse a, essentially a policy proposal in the same way that you can endorse a council member running for office or, or a candidate running for council. Um, but I think that is a point of confusion for a lot of board members is where this fell within their purview. So thinking about the, the broader effort around revising um, change or, you know, updating how boards and commissions work. You know, there was some some results of that that work recently that were released. I think, you know, hopefully part of that could be maybe clarifying this for people when they're joining boards and commissions, their ability, you know, to speak for themselves as board members on issues. Um, but of course, if they choose not to, that is understandable too. Um, excuse me, I meant speak for themselves on issues that weren't necessarily brought to them by the city, that they are allowed to do that, clarifying that specifically. Um, but um, yeah, can, can understand uh, reasons why some folks didn't say on, and like I said, in most cases, uh, folks just didn't write back. <laughs> so um, pretty good though for email, which is not always the, the you know, easiest medium. So um, the next step is to uh, reach out to council members, um, new members, as well as folks continuing on. So um, once the election fully wraps up, then um, I'll start on that. And if anybody wants to, to join me in meeting with council members at any point, let me know. Of course, we can only have only have two of us <laughs> for each of those meetings. But if you would like to be one of those people in one of those any of those meetings, just let me know. Um, and I'll be happy to include you. That'll probably happen. I'll try to get talk to some folks before you know before the end of the year, but probably some a number will be in January, I would think. Um, I I'm trying to remember is the retreat is in March. The council retreat is in March. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. So we have some time. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, yeah. Lastly, I thought it'd be fun to note that Austin removed parking minimums throughout 
the city um, on November 2nd. So it became, by doing that, it became the biggest city in the U.S. to take this um, step in updating their street parking policy. And they also have a council manager form of government. So similarly, it was passed, you know, with a majority of council members. Um, so it's good inspiration <laughs> for, uh, for, for us uh, moving forward. And then, oh, one more thing I'll add, since you brought up um, Tila earlier in talking about the MPP and, you know, other recommendations we might have, I'd be, yeah, happy to chat about that more. I certainly haven't, I've been like very focused in my hours just on this off street stuff and haven't done any other, you know, um, worked on any other part or thought about any of the other parts of um, the on street management. Um, and I do think there are probably a few recommendations we as a group could come to based on conversations we've had over time. Um, I think it, it might be difficult to communicate them at the same time to council members. I don't know. Um, I'm, but I'd be interested in hearing others thoughts on like, how to like, what would be the most effective way to go about that. Um, so yeah, we'd love to talk about it more though. Yeah, I don't Thank think you, that's Becky, something this is either. so I'm, I'm so impressed with, with the re outreach that you've done. Um, I have on election night, I had someone approach me. She is on, I think, on OSMP, which is like, I, who is this person? What is this thing? What's going on? <laughs> um, and so I think for some of those holdouts who think that or who aren't sure that they have enough information, aren't sure where they're coming, where you're coming from, do feel free to send them my way. I think uh, coming out of our tab retreat, you and I were sort of tasked with with teaming up on, on this effort. And so um, just sort of as the second in line, I'm definitely taking far second fiddle to what you, the efforts you've done. But if you think it's worth trying to wrangle another, you know, three or four people, I may be able to, to assuage the uh, concerns of some of the people um, who have told you they don't, they're not sure, they don't un understand, they're not, you know, sure where this is coming from. So. I'm, I'm happy and I do have time at the moment to, to handle some of that. Great, thanks. Yeah, I appreciate that, Tila. And I'll definitely definitely let you know. I, I figure also, you know, folks who maybe don't feel ready now if, if this item does make it onto council's agenda and then is going to come to boards, that'll be another opportunity for us to go back and um, engage with folks and say, okay, well, now this is a formal city item. Let's <laughs> let's chat about it. Um, so, so I look forward to that too. And um, yeah, I really appreciate that. Uh, offered help i'll keep you posted yeah thanks becky and you've assembled a, a very impressive roster so far and atila whoever you can add would be would be great and i look forward to seeing what the two of you can do as far as bringing that to the individual council members and walking them through the the process and maybe that would be a good opportunity to speak to the the npp and maybe that's something we can talk about as a board between now and then Alex, can I also just quickly add my my laudits? Um, I, I thank you, Becky. I, this is really impressive leadership, and um, the, the easiest thing for a board member to do is to just take the things that come in front of them. But you you had a real vision here, and this is this is really like high value add for for a board member. And this is we should this is like what board members should be doing. So um, I think it's you, you're you're a role model for, for other board members to have vision and to go after it. And uh, I'm grateful for that. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's I appreciate everyone's everyone's support in the endeavor. It's uh, yeah, um, it's been uh, fun to reach out and <laughs> connect with folks on other boards. So, um, yeah. So, but I'll I'll keep everyone posted as we uh, keep rolling here. Sounds great. Before we talk about Ryan and maybe give Ryan a chance to speak, does uh, the board members have any other things they'd like to bring up under matters? I just want to invite everybody to the World Day of Remembrance. It's this Sunday at 11 a.m. We're co-hosting with the city of Boulder, and hopefully everybody here can make it. Um, we're going to have a crash survivor speak. She's a member of our community. Her name's Laurel, and the mayor is going to speak, and some council members as well, and hopefully someone from TAB beyond me. But anyway, um, <laughs> hope to see you guys there. And so we're meeting, it's me, you're meeting at the courthouse on 14th right. Street on Pearl Street Mall. Thank you so much, Tila. Yes, we're meeting here <laughs> at 7 a.m. like we did last year. It's going to be nice and sunny and it'll be wonderful. So. And is it is it definitely 11 a.m.? I, I saw 1 p.m. somewhere. Okay, so we should meet at 11 a.m. Okay. Yeah, because then we're going to do a short walk. So 
after we we hear from people we'll and we'll finish at the tea house we're including boulder high just to include magnus white so um and that's all i have thank you great thank you for that reminder um with that we know we're all in the midst of an election where everyone's vote gets to get counted and we're still a few days away from being at that point but as the votes currently fall ryan is in place to be elected to council so nothing's definitive as of now so we didn't put it on the agenda but we wanted to um, acknowledge that this might be ryan's last tab meeting in this capacity and if it is thank him for his service to this board if it's not we will we will welcome you back It'd be a pleasure to have you back but hopefully that's not the case so we'll um sort of awkward timing with with this meeting and the the way the, the tallying is going but Ryan, thank you. You've been a tremendous voice on this board for the last three years. The way you've gotten so involved in the community so quickly has been impressive and we'd be well suited to have you serving us on, on council. So hopefully that's that's what we get to to see. And I, I think Ryan might have some some words um and some ideas, but before we let him talk, if anyone else has anything um to say about Ryan's service, feel free to to chip in. Well, I talked Ryan into applying for TAB and I tried to talk him out of running for council. <laughs> um, and this is one of the rare occasions I have a difficult time articulating my feelings, <laughs> but it has been an absolute gratifying pleasure to pull you in and to see you jump off the next cliff, it's been terrific. I am so proud of you. I'm so proud of knowing you. And I think uh, you have been very consequential in your time on the board. So personally, I would like to see you continue, but if you have to go on and be one of the boss people, go on and be one of the boss people and don't forget us little people. Well, I just want to say thank you, Ryan, for everything, everything that you have brought to the board and everything. Um, I got to know Ryan a lot more on our journeys to NACTO, and it was really cool to see how you flourished in that whole week um, and how excited you were about council. So I am really, really happy. And OK, I'm, I'm jumping, but um, but I I really hope that that you are that you get one of those seats because it will be incredible to know that our voice is there with you. So thank you. That's sad. Yeah. I'll um, follow up on uh, what Trini said and it, it's, thank you for running in general, running for council. It's a huge undertaking. Um, uh, Sorry, Tila, I, <laughs> I wasn't sure what you're reacting to. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, so thank you for running for council and um, yeah, your willingness like to serve on the board, but then to, to kind of go even beyond and to serve on council. And um, I think ultimately that's really how transportation changes like across the country is changing our, you know, how our leaders view it and what they're willing to do to change it and invest in it. So I think it's just really the is ultimately the most critical thing is having people in office who are who are committed to that. Um, so so thank you for for recognizing that and and pursuing it and of course for everything you've contributed um, during your time on the board. Well said, everyone. Looking forward to your your bold leadership, whether it's it's here, hopefully there. All right. Thanks, Alex. Uh, thanks, everybody. Should I say something now and then? We... <laughs> okay. Well, um, yeah. Kind of, kind of a, um, kind of an odd, odd goodbye. Got, not clear if I'm hired for the next job or not. Hopefully, we won't have to do this again. But if we do it again, um, so um, I'll knock on wood and say a few words. I guess. Um, so three things. Um, so um, first, I would just like to share that. Um, 
if I do end up leaving the PAB uh, for city council, it, it is in the mission of transportation. And um, it is the experience uh, here with TAB that it's got, got me wanting to do this. Um, I've gotten to know the transportation team and the department as one of the, the, the things that has the greatest impact on people's day-to-day -day life experiences in Boulder. And um, it, the transportation department and our transportation initiatives is a value center for the community. It is something that if we put money into and resources into, we get things back, we get money back, both households and the city. And um, I'm just really excited about trying to create more, more resources and support and space for this team to do that work. Um, and at the same time, to uh, advance, uh, I guess, a sense of accountability, that that's something this department should be doing. Um, and so that's the direct work we've been doing. It's to more integrated land use policy or work with land use and then with wider regional and state work. So um, anyway, just to just to state that maybe the obvious, which is, um, yeah, I'm, I'm heading to council, hopefully with the, the transportation agenda. Um, the second thing is I am um, I'm just blown away with what Natalie and Valerie, uh, the team have built over both of your tenures and others here. Um, I'm really just so excited about the direction of things, um, the infrastructure programs, the focus on Vision Zero and, and bringing policy ideas, advocacy ideas like we just heard from Devin, um, the data driven systems work like from Daniel team and I'm just thinking about today, but um, I'm just really optimistic about where the department and the city through transportation is going. Um, and if I had to offer one word of, um, I guess, course clarity, uh, it would be on CAN um, and just maybe some gentle encouragement to say that um, for, from my perspective, the, the full intent of CAN is to create no compromise protection for people who are outside of cars on our arterials. Um, it is explicitly a commitment to make protected bike lanes on IRIS that was in, written into the staff's, or excuse me, the council's presentation that is viewable um, on YouTube um, as part of the retreat. Uh, and it was the basis for a 9-0 vote um, to make it a work plan priority. So, um, you know, I've been to some community meetings and I've heard, you know, some, um, I don't know, maybe that's not clear to the community. And so I think it's not something the department really has space to back off on. Um, it's, it's, Codified, and um, we need to get it on track. And if residents have a, a problem with that, then um, refer it to city council. So um, that's my second thing. And uh, the third thing is just a final thought on um, what I think is overcoming what is one of our biggest barriers to doing more, uh, and that's change management at the community level. And um, to the extent I'm in this role on the board to bring my own specific perspective, uh, I guess I would just try to offer something new today and say, as somebody who's spent quite a bit of time talking with community members over the last few months, literally campaigning for, for office, um, I, I think that it's important for us to think about the, the, the real big improvement opportunities we have to make in our transportation system represent disruption by definition. And to do just to, to, to make this transformation work through disruption in any setting requires change management. And so change management makes it clear to the participants what we're doing, what's the vision, what are, what are the exciting things we're moving towards, what are the benefits that will accrue, why is it urgent? Um, and there's different change management frameworks, so pick whatever. But, but just to point out that I think a lot of our community members um, don't have a lot of understanding about the, the the great benefits that will come when we make our system systematically safer um, and we give people a chance to live more freely without a car or with less with less need for a car. And I think we have some work to do as a, I guess, council as a political body, as our as our executive level within staff and with our transportation department to sell this, to sell this to the community and um, and and not just, you know, kind of go unit by unit sort of <laughs> quietly along. We we need to we need to really sell it. And um, again, I think this is rooted in evidence based uh, study of change management, and um, it's it's going to be the most important thing for um, for our success. So um, I hope to be partner in that and helping the community understand the, the great opportunity to make our transportation system and our community safer, more affordable, more inclusive, um, 
but we're going to have to sell it. And um, I, I think that's going to be something we should think more about together. So um, I'll just close and thank, thank you again, Natalie and Valerie and the rest of the team for your tutelage and partnership and also Tila for getting me into this and Alex and Trini and Becky for everything. So um, I think that's it. I'll sign off. Thanks, Ryan. I was just going to add, thanks, Ryan. And um, yeah, hopefully, you know, we'll uh, keep working together. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that concludes matters. Uh, agenda topic eight, future agenda topics. Looks like a light December schedule. Please let me know if there's anything that's that's super pressing you'd like to discuss in December. Um, it sounds like if staff might might not have a whole lot we've, we've considered post not doing that meeting and just reconvening after the new year. So if there's any strong reason to do a December meeting, please let Tila. Uh, this isn't really so much about agenda topics in December, but typically around this time of year, we would be doing our letter to council for their um, uh, retreat. And then we would have a retreat a little bit later, given that the council retreats in March. Are we anticipating a March retreat or will it be later than that? Right. So we um, so we haven't received any uh, communication about a letter for from boards to council. Um, so we'll we'll share that if we do get any you know request for that. Um, but to my knowledge, Meredith, please jump in and correct me if, if yeah, you're where I, I'm, I'm almost positive that there hasn't been a request yet. So um, we will definitely keep you all apprised when we learn about that or what the request is. Um, and then as far as the timing of our retreat, we can consider something um, around the same time or closely following. I think we had been kind of timing it around that May timeframe the last couple of years. Um, but if there's an interest in timing it differently, we're open to that. Um, just certainly, you know, we can stay in conversation about it. I think with the council retreat, the council retreat list this year's upcoming year will be later than typical. So the letter process would probably start a little late as well. Okay, so with that, that concludes our agenda for this evening. So entertain a motion to adjourn. Trini with the motion. A second. Okay. Oh, second. Trini, yeah. okay. <laughs> Trini with the motion, Becky with the second. All those in favor? Right. Unanimous with five votes. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Mm -hmm.